Welcome back to our lecture series based upon the textbook Linear Algebra Done Openly. Uh, as usual, I'm your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misselein. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about section 5.3 from the textbook entitled Kramer's Rule. And I'll be honest, I get a, I have a very mixed feelings. I have mixed feelings when it comes to Kramer's Rule. Uh, not a huge fan of it, but that's mostly just because most people who use it are using it inappropriately. And I'll, I'll make sense of why that is going on here. Kramer's Rule is actually great uh, when you use it in the right perspective. It's often abused and mistreated here. So... Uh, what is Kramer's rule? We'll define what it is in just a second. Uh, but a little bit of notation I want to introduce for the sake of Kramer's rule. Um, suppose we have a matrix A whose columns are given as A1, A2, A3, up to AN. Uh, you can see those right here. And suppose we have a vector B right here. Uh, the plan that's going to be happening here is we're going to be looking at the equation AX equals B. And so this matrix A is the coefficient matrix here. This vector B is the vector on the right. Uh, but before we get to that here, we'll introduce a new matrix, which A was n by n. It's a square matrix. We're going to also define an n by n matrix AIB, where AIB is just identical to A. Uh, that is, you'll have A1 will be there, A2 will be there, A3 will be there, all the way up to AN will be there. It's just in the middle, in the ith column of A, we're going to replace the ith column with this vector B. Everything else is identical. And so this is what we mean by this, this matrix AIB. I can't say I'm in love with the notation, but we'll, we'll use it for right now. It, it gets the point across and uh, it's really only used in this section, uh, but it'll make sense which we see right now. So Kramer's rule is a technique for solving systems of equations. If we're trying to solve the, the system AX equals B, Kramer's rule actually offers us a formula for solving this. Imagine we have a square Square matrix A, which is n by n, it's also a non-singular matrix. And suppose we also have a vector B, that is, we're trying to solve the equation AX equals B. Well, since A is non-singular, there's a unique solution to the equation AX equals B. And that unique solution can be given by the following formula. If the solution is X, then XI, the ith entry in the vector X, can be given by this formula. So, or another way of writing it here, our vector X... Uh, we get x1, x2, up to xn. We're just saying that the first entry is going to look like the determinant of a1b divided by the determinant of a. And then the second entry is the determinant of a2b. That is, we replace the second column of a with b, and you div divide that by the determinant of a. And you go all the way down until you get to the determinant of anb, you take the matrix A, you replace its nth column with B, take that determinant, and then divide that by the determinant of A. And so this gives us a formula. Uh, this is a formula for the or for the vector X. It's a formula for the solution to a linear system. Well, that sounds kind of great, right? Um, formulas are great. I can just plug in the numbers and just compute it like that. That sounds great. It's not a formula, right? If you have an equation AX squared plus BX plus C, um, you can see, you can sing the tune, pop goes the weasel, and you can solve your, uh, your quad equation using the quadratic formula. It offers an alternative where we don't have to complete the square. Um, sometimes it'd be difficult to do. We don't have to factor it, which can be difficult to do and sometimes impossible to do. Depends on the field of coefficients you're looking at there. And so formulas are great, right? Uh, formula. Um, what if we have... What if we have AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX plus D equals zero? What if we have a cubic polynomial, right? Uh, how does one do that? Did you know? Um, my guess is probably not, although some people have heard of it before. Um, I, I'm quite certain you probably had that in any great extent in your previous algebra classes, college algebra, intermediate algebra, you talk about the quadratic formula, the cubic formula. Um, there's also a quartic formula, that is for four, degree four polynomials. Why, are, why aren't these things being used more popular? I would recommend Googling it sometime. Um, um, go to Wikipedia. There, there's, there's a good description of it there. It, it's a formula, but it's very, very difficult to use. So difficult that it becomes very impractical. Um, no... Uh, no professor is going to throw this upon their students 
is unless it's like some crazy honors class or something. It's really, really, really hard to use. It, it turns out Kramer's rule kind of follows in the same category, that we have a formula for the solution of a system of linear equations, but this formula is extremely difficult to use because of all the determinants that are involved. We'll see some examples of this in just a moment. And it also begs the question, we, if I want to solve the system AX equals B, do I need a new formula? Can't I just solve it using row reduction, which is actually efficient algorithm. Um, and so actually, I will, we'll talk a little bit more about the difficulty of Kramer's rule in just a second, kind of verify its truthfulness. And in Kramer's rule, I should also mention there are some limitations, right? That first of all, the matrix has to be square in by in, otherwise this formula does not apply. And how many systems have we considered that aren't square systems? And even if it's square, the matrix has to be non-singular. Um, admittedly, if it's if it's a singular matrix, there might not be a solution, so it might be inconsistent. But even if there is a solution, um, there could be unique solutions, there could be multiple solutions. Kramer's rule doesn't do anything for those. Kramer's rule has very limited scope compared to systems of equations, and it's also very hard to use. So why would anyone ever use it? Again, we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. This is the this is the mixed feelings I was talking about earlier. Um, I should mention that even if A is singular, that is the determinant is zero, um, one can still say something about this. Uh, if you clear the denominators of this equation right here, you get the determinant of A times Xi is equal to the determinant of AIB. And so that's actually the formula we want to prove. When the determinant's non-zero, you can divide by it to get the formula we had up here. Uh, but this, this, this is the, the more general equation we can use for even singular matrices. And the argument's gonna basically be the following. We're gonna take the matrix A and we're gonna times it by the matrix I, I of X. Where, what do we mean by this? The I here, this represents the identity matrix. This is the matrix with um, one side the di down the diagonals, zero everywhere else. And X here, this is meant to be a solution, a uh, solution to, to our equation here, AX equals B. That is, if you times X by A, you get B. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. All right. And so let's expand the matrix IIX by the notation we saw on the previous slide. IIX means you take the identity matrix whose columns look like the EIs. You get EI1, EI2, EI3, etc. Remember, EI1 was the vector with a 1 in the first spot, zeros everywhere else. EI2 was the vector with a, two in the, a 1 in the second spot, zero everywhere else. And so we're just going to get the identity matrix. EN, right? One in the last position, zeros everywhere else. Um, but because of the IIX notation, we're going to put an X in the ith column. Well, in terms of matrix multiplication, if you times a matrix by a matrix, that's equivalent to multiplying each individual column of the second matrix by the entirety of the first matrix. So this product will look like its first column is AE1, its second column is AE2. Its ith column will be AX, and then its last column will be AEN. Now, one thing that's important about the vectors EI is if you take a matrix and you times it by a column of the identity, this will equal, so if you times A by the ith column of the identity, this will give you the ith column of A. And so we're going to use this observation right here. And so we get that A. E1 gives us the first column of A. A, E2 gives us the second column of A. And this will continue on. The last one will be the nth column of A. And all of these are going to reproduce columns of A except for the, this ith position. The ith position is just AX. And like we saw earlier, AX is equal to B. And so you'll notice that this right here is the matrix A, I, B. So with respect to this A, I, B matrix, we have a factor as A times IIX. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take that observation. So we take A times IIX. This is equal to AIB. And we're going to take the determinant of this thing. Take the determinant of the left-hand side. Uh, take the determinant of the right-hand side like so. Now the determinant factors, remember, uh, when you have a product inside of a determinant, that becomes a product of determinants. So you get the determinant of A times the determinant 
of i i x, and this will equal the determinant of a i b. Now this almost establishes the formula we had before. Uh, the last part really just comes down to this piece right here. Uh, this right here is none other than the number x i. Because uh, the idea is matrix, it, it looks mostly like the identity, right? You're going to have a one, a bunch of zeros. You're going to have a one, a bunch of zeros. Then you have these entries x1, x2, x3, x4, and then a bunch of zeros and a one right here. If you start cofactoring, expanding across this row, uh, I'm sorry, not this, not to do the row, do the call. If you cofactor expand across this one, you'll end up with just this minor, and that's all there is. Then cofactor expand this one, you'll get this minor right here. And then you cofactor expand this one right here. Um, in the end, the only thing you're left with will be uh, just a single xi, and it'll be the xi for which you were in that column. This is the third column, so you end up with x3. And so you end up with the determinant of a times xi is equal to the determinant of i of aib, which is like we, we said earlier, that's what we were trying to prove. Uh, that verifies Kramer's rule.